us and know you're worshiping with us, honors us, encourages us. So thank you so very much. A few announcements that we want to make before we get started. Uh, great news we mentioned last week about Leonardo Barrientos. Her treatments have worked. She has no cancer. And so we're excited uh, about that and grateful for her and for her family. And that great news. <coughs> Amanda Brister is a friend of many of our number here in Medill, a teacher in Kingston, and she suffered a stroke. Uh, she's in the hospital, and it's touch and go. We even ask to remember Amanda in our prayers, and we certainly want to do that. John Hall continues his chemotherapy treatments, and we're praying that these are successful for him. We want to uh, continue to pray for him and Patty. Judy Bryant is recovering from a fractured ankle and is in a walking boot. We want to wish her a speedy recovery. Nadine Garrison is doing great. They are looking at doing a sleep study to um, see if uh, are we having issues? Ah. Okay. Wow, that, that's picking us up there. Thank you. Um, Nadine Garrison is doing great. They are considering doing a sleep study, but she's doing great. She's home, and we're grateful for that news. Um, also, we want to continue to remember Mary Beth Hudson, Kenneth Harrison, Kirk Hallmark, Jill Meggie, and Casey Jacobs, uh, among many that you know. Bible study will be this Wednesday. We're continuing our study on some of the Psalms. And this Wednesday, we're going to look at Psalm 42. Uh, it's a very familiar psalm, and I hope that you'll take the time to read it this week and make yourself familiar with it again. And we will look at Psalm 42 Wednesday night at 7 p.m. <clears throat> Nod from Todd. Uh, keep doing those. We're going to start slowing down a little bit. Uh, we'll not have a nod from Todd tomorrow, but we'll have one on Tuesday. And I appreciate those that are listening to, to uh, those things. Our worship on Sunday morning is now being broadcast on KMAD at 12 noon. Search program is also being uh, broadcast at 8.30. So we hope that those who do not have Facebook or YouTube can tune in and hear Todd's message, hear my message, I guess, and, and the announcements and keep up with what's going on. And hope you'll let others know about that. As far as returning to worship, I'll let uh, one of our elders share those things with you at the conclusion of our service uh, this morning. Contributions. We now have that up and running again, I say we. John and Courtney have worked very hard uh, to get it back to where it was supposed to be. And I appreciate John and Courtney throughout this ordeal. I want you to know they have uh, stood tall. They have been called upon to work a little bit extra in uh, making sure that we can have this program, that we can have this broadcast, and I appreciate John and Courtney so very much, and I lean on them uh, more than anyone would know, and uh, they've always been there for me and for us. But uh, you can go to the website, Medill Church of Christ website, there's a donate button there, and you're able to make your contributions there, you can bring them by, you can mail them to our post office box 88 here in Medill. VBS, <clears throat> July 27th through the 30th, and the theme is Jonah. Uh, and so we hope that we're able to have that. A lot of things have been going on in regards to that, uh, T-shirts and, and other things, and appreciate everyone who's been working diligently about that. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us and worshiping with us. And we hope that you will worship with us, that you'll sing the songs with us, that you'll pray with us, that you'll have your Bible and a pen and paper, or take notes or write them in your Bible as well. But it truly is an honor for us to worship together as we praise God and we encourage one another through songs and prayers and through God's Word.
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you this day we've had to come and worship you. Father, be with those that uh, are worshiping with us in their homes. Father, just uh, bless them and encourage them. And Father, uh, we look forward to the time we all meet together uh, next week and just uh, uh, be with each of us. Father, help us to always remember that, uh, that you're always with us no matter where we're at. And Father, that, you, uh, that you'll take care of us and watch over us. Father, uh, bless those that, uh, that are uh, struggling and as we uh, go through this period. And uh, Father, that I uh, pray that our country uh, get through this. Father, uh, be with the doctors and those, and their, those that are looking for cures and antidotes. Father, be with all those that have the virus and just get them well. Father, also be with all of our sick. Father, uh, we have a number that are sick. Uh, Father, continue to be with Nadine, and Don Hall, and Don Hasselman, uh, with Amanda, uh, Judy Bryant. Uh, continue to be with Mary Beth and Kenneth. And Father, we have some more. Uh, just be with each one of them. And Father, help us, uh, help them as they uh, go through this period uh, where they're not as not don't have the health that they normally have father continue to watch over them and be with the doctors and the nurses as they take care of them and help them get better so they can again be with us father also uh help us to remember that uh, we need to always put you first father remember that uh, that you loved us enough to send your son and father help us to to live a life that uh, shows that we appreciate that and father that uh, also that we love you back and father help us to always remember that uh, we need to be the examples we should be so when we're in our everyday life people see that there's something special in our lives and that's you father uh, thank you so much for your son and the great sacrifice thank you for this uh, day we've had to worship that we have to worship you and uh, thank you so much for loving us and caring for us most of all father thank you for your son and his name, amen. <clears throat>
It's time now to remember our Savior as we uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. Will you please bow with me? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the love that you had to let your Son come to this earth, Father, on, on behalf of us uh, as sinners, Father. Father, we're so thankful that Jesus was willing to go to that cruel cross on our behalf. Father, we, uh, we know that uh, he has a tremendous love for us to, to be willing to go through that horrible beating and that tremendous sacrifice on that cross, Father. And we know through that sacrifice that as Christians uh, we receive mercy and grace and forgiveness from you. And we thank you for that, Father. We pray for mercy when the time comes that your son comes back to this earth to gather up the Christians, Father. And we, we look forward to the day that we're able to be in heaven with you and your son. Father, as we take of this bread that represents the body of your son, we clear our minds of all worldly thoughts and we, we think of your son, Father. We think of what he did for us. And we want him to know that we love him so much for being willing to do that for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Again, Father, we come thanking you so much for the, the sacrifice that was given for us on that cross and for the blood that was shed. And, Father, uh, for the great uh, love that was shown us. Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood that was shed for us, Father, let us realize how much love, how much sacrifice, and how much pain was shown us. And Father, let us partake of this in a manner well pleasing thee. And thank you so much for loving us. In your son's name, amen.
It's a good song. Will your anchor hold? We're going to talk this morning about what happens when we're dealing with a storm or difficulties or, or hard times or just strenuous circumstances. I believe that you find out a lot about someone when the chips are down, when things aren't working out the way that they would like or when life seems unfair or when they're dealing with something that seems to be insurmountable that we find out about people. Because it's in those circumstances that those layers of facade and pretense are stripped away. And you really see deep into somebody's heart and deep into their life and deep into their character. But not only that, it's in difficult days that I believe you really find out who your friends are. I'm sure that many of you have gone through some hard times some very strenuous or uh, stressful times, sometimes when uh, things didn't, were not right, uh, they were un, life was unfair, or things were being done and, and said about you or in your life, and you really find out who's going to stand by you, who re- your real friends are, who will be there, not just when the sun is shining, but also when it seems very dark. So you find out who your friends are. Not only that, but it's in those difficult days and we're dealing with difficulties that you find out how strong your faith is. It's easy to claim to be faithful when things are going well, when things are rolling along smoothly, when there are no issues whatsoever. It's easy to say that we're faithful. But we find out really how strong our faith is when we're dealing with difficulties in our lives. Not only that, but we also find out what our priorities are. When life begins to be a struggle, when it's very difficult to just get by and you're just trying to keep your head above water, we start thinking about what's essential and what's not essential, what's important and what's not important, what our priorities really are, and what they should not be. We all deal with difficulties. We all deal with those hard times. It happens no matter how young we might be, no matter how old we are. Uh, I have counsel with those that were teenagers up through 60, 70 years old that deal with difficult days in their lives. And so it doesn't matter Whether you're young or whether you're old, it doesn't matter if you're extremely wealthy or if you're extremely poor. You're going to deal with hardship in your life. You're going to deal with those difficult times. It doesn't matter if you're faithful or if you're not faithful. If you're, uh, you know, your relationship with God is what it ought to be or if you are an immoral and sinful person. Sometimes we think that because we're faithful, we shouldn't have problems, but It doesn't take long in life for us to realize that even Christians, and we look through God's Word and we see some of the most faithful men and women of God had some very difficult days in their lives. So I want us to look at a person that went through some difficult times. I think if we look at Paul and we look at how he dealt with a very difficult time in his life, it will help us. That we'll learn some things that we can apply in our lives that will last us, that will stick with us, that we can carry through good days and bad days, but especially in those dark days, in those difficult days, we can turn to this passage and we can look at these things and say, yeah, this is what I need to do. This is what will help me. And you think about Paul in 2 Timothy. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 6 here in just a minute. But here Paul is writing the last letter of the letters that he wrote, the letters that are included in God's Word. 2 Timothy is the last time that we hear from the great Apostle Paul. It's here now. He's in prison for the second time. The first time he was in Rome, it was under house arrest. And he could move around and he could... He could lay down in the comfort of his bed or sit in a very comfortable chair. and He could have visitors come and see him anytime he wanted. He just had to stay in a house. This time, it's not a house. It seems to me that it's a dark, damp, 
uh, prison that he's in, maybe in the dungeons of a prison, but it's not comfortable, it's not easy. He doesn't have any freedom whatsoever. And Paul knew that things were not good. He knew that in regards to his life, it was probably short. The days ahead looked very bleak for him. He would say in verse 6 that I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, as a sacrifice to God. Now, when you pour out a drink offering, once it's empty, then it's gone. And Paul's saying, my life is just about gone. Things look bleak for him. It was a very stressful time, no doubt, or it should have been. It was a very dark time. Not only that, but there he is, confined to a cell block where he had no freedom. He was just pretty much uh, relegated to eat, sleep, and maybe he's going to talk about study and see a few people, uh, but that's about it. It wasn't pleasant whatsoever. And the thing about Paul is he had so many things to do. He had so many things. He had been one that had traveled the world. I mean, he was a world traveler. He'd gone all over the known world preaching the gospel He'd gone by ship, he'd gone by foot, he'd gone by many different ways. And now there are still people that I'm sure he wanted to see. There are churches that he wanted to go and talk to again and encourage them and teach them and give them the things that they needed. Paul was one that wanted to make sure that everything was okay with the congregations that he helped establish. And I have no doubt that he was concerned about that. You know, Paul would say that it was the concerns for Christians that would keep him up that he suffered many things, and on top of it all was his concern for Christians. And so he was concerned about them. He had a lot of things that he wanted to do, and now he's not able to do them. It was a dark day, a dark time for him. What do you do? What did he do in these difficult times? I think we can learn from Paul. And so I hope that you'll have pen and paper and that you'll have your Bibles open to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm going to begin by reading verses 6, 7, and 8. Paul says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. He says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. Therefore, In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but to all of those who will have loved his appearing. So what do we learn? One of the things that Paul talks about here and that we need to do whenever we're facing difficult days, whether it's a report from the doctor or whether it's something else that's going on in our lives, whenever the days are tough, whenever life is uncertain, whenever it seems like things are unfair, we need to, number one, make sure. I'm talking about making sure that we're ready, that we're ready whether Christ comes or whether we're called home, no matter what happens, that we are ready in regards to our future, in regards to our relationship with God. Paul reminds himself, and he says, that uh, he's fought this fight, he finished the course, he's kept the faith, and he knows that there's a crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. This crown that goes to the victors. And Paul says, look, I win. No matter what happens in this trial that I'm about to deal with, no matter what happens with the circumstances I find myself in at this time, I am a winner. And that had to have given him confidence, knowing that no matter what, his relationship with God is where it ought to be and what it ought to be, and he's going to win. Confidence is something that comes from a right relationship. When we know that we're right with God, we need to make sure that we look at our relationship, that we consider our example in our life, and we look at our, our, our faith. Make sure that we're where God wants us to be, where we know we ought to be. You see, difficulties, they strip away all all that fluff, and they really help us see if our anchor is steadfast and sure. We sang the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. 
You see, difficulties help us to, to know whether we have that blessed assurance. We sing the song, I know that my Redeemer lives. It's during difficulties that we perhaps lean more upon that fact and that relationship. We need to make sure. If we're ready, then nothing that happens really matters. Paul talks about that a little bit. He, he would say that if I live, I live for Christ. If I die, I die for Christ. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. For that, is, to depart and be with Christ is very much better. Paul would say in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, that he knows. He, he is confident. He says, for this reason I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. Paul said, it doesn't matter what happens to me. I know that what I've done and, and my life, my soul that I've given to God is going to be okay. And so Paul could write, as he did early in Romans chapter 8, that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose. So, brethren, let me tell you, when you're going through difficult circumstances, when life seems hard and unfair, one of the things that you need to do is look at yourself and make sure that no matter what happens, that you win. Paul could say, O grave, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And at the end of that passage in 1 Corinthians 15, he'd say, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Make sure, make sure where you, you're where you need to be in your relationship with God, and it helps with dealing with those difficult days. Second of all, one of the things that I believe is essential when going through hard times is to lean on our friends. Look what he says, beginning in verse 9. He's writing to Timothy, and he says, Make every effort to come to me soon now you can hear the sorrow the loneliness in paul's words here when he says for demas having loved this present world has deserted me and he's gone to thessalonica crescens has gone to galatia titus to dalmatia only luke is with me Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. Paul dearly wants company while he's in prison. Someone to come and visit with him. Someone to check on him. Someone that he can talk to that will talk to him. He says Demas had deserted him. Crescens and Titus were gone. And he uses that word only Luke. Just Luke. Now Luke, the great physician that accompanied Paul and was a great Christian in Jerusalem. He was a great man, but he wanted more. He wanted to lean on friends. He needed his friends. You know what that's like. When you have difficult days, and you need someone that you can talk to, that you can lean on, there's nothing worse than the feeling of being alone. You look around, you don't have anyone there to encourage you, to pat you on the back, a shoulder to lean upon and to cry upon, a handshake, a hug. There's nothing worse than being alone. Now, I know, and we'll talk about it later, we know that God is with us. I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you, Hebrews 13. Jesus says, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the age. And we understand that, and we, we, we are grateful for that, but... It's kind of like the little girl who called her daddy in one night. It was storming. It was dark. It just seemed extra bad that night. And She said, Dad, I'm scared. Stay with me. And he said, No, let's pray and just know that God is here with you. And so they prayed, and he left the room, and pretty soon she's calling and crying out, Dad, Dad, come here. And she said, Look, I want you to stay with me. I'm scared. And he says, No, look, we had a prayer, and you know that God is with you. And she said, Yeah, but I want someone with skin on them. There's something about that the power of fellowship and friendship. 
Paul seems to be needing that. Friends are so very helpful. They don't even have to say anything. I think about Job's friends. You know, Job's friends came from a long distance to be with him during his time of grief and sorrow, during those difficult days when he'd lost everything except for uh, himself and his wife. Job's friends came. It says that they came and they sat with him for seven days and did not say a word. To be honest, they were probably probably more helpful when they were just there than when they spoke. Sometimes we have friends that are going through difficult times in their lives, and it, it seems like it's awkward. What do we say? I might say the wrong thing. I mean, I've never dealt with this before. I want to tell you, you really don't have to say anything. I want to tell you something else. A lot of times when you say something... People don't remember what you say, but they remember your presence. And we need to understand that we need to lean on our friends and we need to let our friends, when they're going through difficult days, lean on us. Just presence alone can be so very comforting, so very powerful. The third thing that I admire about Paul that I think we should look to and and try to apply in our lives when going through very difficult days in verse 11 he says only luke is with me pick up mark bring him with you and look at the end for he is useful to me for service paul says i still have work to do even though i'm in prison i haven't stopped doing what i ought to do in my service to the lord sometimes I believe that difficulties come in our lives to distract us. The difficulties come to to prevent us from accomplishing something in the name of the Lord. God allowed Satan to test Job, and Job remained faithful to God. If we allow difficulties and hard times, if we allow uh, things that are unfair to prevent us from continuing our faithful service to God, then Satan wins. Whether the difficulties are just because of life, or they might be because of Satan, or they might be because of who knows. But if they prevent us from fulfilling the things that God would have us to do in our own personal lives, then we let Satan win. Paul is not going to let Satan win. He's going to continue He would write early in 1 Corinthians 15, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Continue working. Here's the thing. If we focus on our service to God and the things that we can do for Him, there are blessings to be found. Instead of focusing on on how horrible things are in my life, and woe is me. We're focusing on productive things and profitable things and and, and things that are beneficial to others and beneficial to God, and we end up benefiting as well. I believe that if we look at the storm long enough that it will overwhelm us, but if we look at what we ought to be doing while in the storm, that we can find peace, we can find comfort. We find relief oftentimes by focusing on others rather than focusing on ourselves and wallowing in self-pity. Paul, there's no self-pity here whatsoever. He is useful to me for service. Another thing that helps when we deal with difficult circumstances and, and hard times when we're Facing life and it seems unfair is to just keep on. I'm going to use the word keep on studying. Look what he says in verse 13. He says, When you come, bring the cloak which I left for Troas, which means it must have been cold there, and the books. Bring the books. Now, remember, Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. Paul expects that the outcome is not very good, that he's going to die. 
And yet he still wants to study. He still wants to read. He still wants to enhance his, himself mentally. He's still studying. Now here I think the books are probably legal books that might help him in his defense before Caesar when he goes to trial. But he hasn't given up. He wants to stay alert mentally. He's not checked out of life. But sometimes people will do when they have a a short period of time ahead of them. You see, Paul was not going to give up. He was not going to give up one day to what he thought was going to happen. Not only was he not going to give up, he wasn't going to give in. And same for us. Don't give up. Don't say that it's just useless and I'm just going to kind of check it in and I'm going to check out of life and check out of living. No, keep studying. Keep yourself alert mentally. And then the other thing that he says at the end of this verse 13, he says, bring the books and especially the parchments. Most think that he's talking about Scripture. Now think about this. Here the Apostle Paul is, inspired of God, the writer of more books in the New Testament than anyone else. And he asked Timothy to bring the Scriptures because he wanted to study them. And I think he found comfort in the Scriptures. And I think he found strength in the Scriptures. And I think he found peace in the Scriptures. And I think he found hope in, in the Scriptures. Even though this great apostle was a great preacher and missionary, a great writer of God's Word, he still wanted to dig into God's Word, seeking guidance and counsel and comfort and wisdom and how convicting it is for me that if Paul still wanted to study late in life, when the days for him were not very long, I need to have that same desire. You need to have that same love. We need to understand the power of reading God's Word and staying by the Bible. God gives us all that we need. In First Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, Paul would tell us, I want to turn there. That the Bible is all that we need. He says, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life, for now, and it holds promise for the life to come. And that comes through the Scriptures, through the sound doctrine in God's Word. God gives us all that we need. Peter would write in 2 Peter chapter 1 that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and to godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us in His glory and His excellence. We need to stay by the Bible. And it will help us through those difficult days. Another thing that I think is important that we see here in Paul as he's dealing with these difficult circumstances is his willingness to let God. By that I mean to let God take care of things that he he shouldn't have to worry about. Look at verses 14 and 15. Now Paul here, just like any human being, is disappointed and sometimes hurt by others. And he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. I don't know if that's emotionally, if that's... Physically, whatever it was, he was not happy with Alexander. And he's letting Timothy know, he did me much harm. But then he says, the Lord will take care of it. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard, he says, against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. Now, look here. 
Paul says, and he's warning his friend Timothy, watch out. But as far as getting even, as far as making him pay, as far as doing bad to him because he did bad to me, God, I'm going to let God handle it. The Bible speaks a lot about revenge. We are told many times that we ought to uh, turn the other cheek Jesus preaches in the Sermon on the Mount. We're reminded to pray for our enemies in Matthew chapter 5. And then in Romans chapter 12, Paul would say, in regards to others, do not seek revenge. Vengeance is mine. Speaking of God, I will repay. How sad it is when those that are going through difficult times waste their energy and waste their effort on people who've done them wrong and wanting to get even or hoping that they get there. We need to let God take care of those things. As a matter of fact, Paul could rest. He could let go of that, knowing that this fact that that God would take care of it. Now, he, he warned others. He didn't want them to go through this that he had gone through. He said, look out for them, which was certainly uh, the right thing to do. But he did not ask for the head of Alexander. He didn't say, look, when I leave, I want you to make sure that you get him back. You heard about the man who was bitten by a dog and came to find out. They ran some tests. The doctor called him in and says, look, you were bitten and the dog proved to be rabid. You're going to have to go through a series of shots so that you will not succumb to to what happens when you get bit by a rabid dog. The man said, I, wait, 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 I need a pen and paper before you start this treatment. And he gave him paper, he started writing things down. The doctor said, what are you writing? A will? I mean, it's not a big deal. We'll start those treatments and you'll be healed. It'll be okay. He said, no, I'm writing down the name of my enemies that I want to go bite before I start these treatments. How sad it is when people nearing the end of their life fill their thoughts with how to get even or how to get back. Paul did not. He let God. And that's what we need to do as well. And then verses 16 through 18. When we go through those dark days, when we're facing difficult times, we need to always remember that we can count on the presence of God and nothing should be more calming than that the promise is that God will be with us he'll help us he'll strengthen us he'll guide us Isaiah 49 verses 15 and 16 it's a wonderful picture where God says a nursing mother would not forget her child how would I forget you And he says in verse 16, basically, that I have written your name on the palm of my hand. God will not forget us. He knows what we're dealing with every second of every minute of every hour of every day. God knows. In Exodus chapter 4, that's when Moses is called by God to go to Egypt. And Moses keeps coming up with reasons why He shouldn't go. And God says in Exodus 4, He said, Look, I'm the one that made you, and I will be with you, and I'll tell you what to say. And He goes on, and the idea is that God says, I will be with you. Moses wasn't sure all that was going to happen in Egypt, but he could be sure of this. God said He would be with him. We might not know what's going to happen the next day or the next week, but we can know that God has promised to be with us. Listen to what Paul says. At my first defense, no one supported me. Everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Verse 17, But the Lord stood with me, and strengthen me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely 
to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul knew about the presence of God. He says, the Lord stood with me. I don't think he stood with him physically. I don't think it was that Jesus stood and everyone saw, there's Jesus standing by him. But by, because of his faith and by his faith, he knew that the Lord was with him. David understood what that was like. In that great 23rd Psalm, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. When we go through those difficult days, when we go through those circumstances in life that seem unfair, and certainly are uncertain, we can count on the presence of God. Let's remember how Paul dealt with his difficulties and learn to apply them in our lives. There's nothing that Paul talks about here that we cannot make applicable in our lives. Every point that we discussed this morning, we can apply in our lives during those difficult days. The main thing, of course, is to make sure that God is on your side. Or really, I should say that you are on God's side. It's at this time at a normal worship service that we would offer an invitation. If there was someone that would need to respond, perhaps you're not on God's side, you're not a child of His, and you realize the benefit and blessing of being a child of His, not just when Christ comes again or when we leave this life, but the benefit and blessing of being a child of God that we find in those difficult days, and you're ready to put Christ on in baptism. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're ready to repent of your sins, confess His name before men, and be immersed in for the forgiveness of your sins, so that the Lord might add you to His church. We can't do that literally, but I can extend that invitation to you. And I want you to know if I can help you in any way to reach out to me, send me a message, give me a call, let me know. And it's not my invitation, it's the Lord. Perhaps you have not been faithful and you realize the difficult days have made you see that I'm not where I ought to be and I need to come back and I need to come home. I need to be restored. Reach out to me. Reach out to one of our elders. Let them know. We can pray with you and we can pray for you. We can let the congregation know (coughs) your desire to be restored. God bless you once again for tuning in this morning. I hope that in some way that it's been beneficial to you and a blessing to you. And I know that we certainly have honored God by being together, even though through technology. We're going to have a closing prayer, a closing scripture. We're going to have some closing thoughts as well by our elders talking about next week. And so stay tuned for that as well. But I want you to know I miss you. I'm so ready for us to be together. And I want you to know that I love you. And I hope that uh, you have a great, great week. Good morning, church. If, uh, if you're like me, it's getting really tiring of constantly second-guessing yourself during this uh, pandemic. We, uh, you're wondering, am I being safe enough? Am I being too safe? Uh, can I go and do this? Can I go and do that or not? Um, and as you all know, as elders, we have been trying to be on the very conservative, safe side uh, in the decisions that we have been making. And we thank God that as far as I know, uh, none of our members have had the, uh, the virus during this time, so we're very thankful for that. Um, as elders, we have decided it's now time to try to find a balance
between being safe and uh, reopening the church for worship so that we can be together. Uh, so next Sunday, we will have worship service at 1045. We ask that you be a little early because we will have ushers who will meet you at the door. These ushers will walk you to uh, your seat or pew. Uh, we'll have every other row closed, so it may take a little extra time to get everyone seated. And uh, there are going to be those here who are not worried about the virus at all. There are going to be those here who are very concerned with the virus, but want to be here to worship together. And there's going to be some who will not be here yet because uh, they're extremely worried about the virus. They fall into a category that makes them very at risk, and we will fully understand uh, why you're not here. And uh, so we just ask that everyone uh, be patient, everyone consider uh, each of these three groups and to know that uh, as elders we will do our very best to keep this uh, next Sunday's worship service uh, as, as safe as we possibly can and we're asking that each member will do their part in uh, keeping the distance and uh, doing the things that we know that we need to do to be safe at this time. So uh, we thank everyone for the patience you've had and uh, speaking for uh, Francis, Eddie, and Kenny. We uh, cannot wait till next Sunday to be together and uh, we truly love each and every member of this church and uh, are looking forward to uh, the future and uh, we, uh, we just pray and ask God that uh, this virus will, uh, will be done uh, so that we'll be back into full uh, to be able to do all the things that we're used to doing. Let's have a close of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, how great you are. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us to come together, even though not in person, but through electronic devices. Father, you've given us that ability, and we thank you for that, to, uh, to be able to, to worship in like spirit, like mind, Father. Father, we long for the day that we'll be able to be back together as the body at this location, Father. Father, we pray that, uh, that this virus, that we'll find uh, cures, for, or not cures, but we'll find inoculations for this that will help us to be able to fend off the virus in the future, Father. We pray that you'll be with those scientists and doctors that are working on uh, these these uh, shots, Father, that soon we'll hopefully be able to all get. And Father, we uh, we just pray that uh, you continue to be with our number and that you'll protect us and watch over us during this time. Father, we thank you for this holiday weekend that you've given us. As Americans, Father, our minds go to the men and to the women who have given their lives, Father, so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we do have as Americans. We're so thankful that we live in America and that we can call ourselves Americans and we can call ourselves free and that we can worship freely without persecution. Father, we, as Christians, we also thank you for those men uh, and women who have given their lives in the past, our ancestors, Father, who have given their lives so that your scriptures uh, have been able to proceed uh, on and that uh, we've been able to have those scriptures and uh, have the Bible, Father. We thank you that for those that have gone on before us that we're willing to give their lives for our Christian freedoms that we have, Father. 
And Father, we thank you especially uh, for the one who gave his life for us, your son Jesus, who gave that ultimate sacrifice, Father. We so thank you for that. Father, we pray that you'll be with this church as we proceed into the future and open our doors back up and again meet together and just watch over us, Father. And we thank you for all the many things that you do for us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, we have a closing, uh, closing scripture. It's Ephesians 6, 23 and 24. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible.
Okay. Boy, that picked up. Yeah, it does. Matter of fact, well, I will put the one, and I'm going to put it this way. Oh, okay. 